this de- in this discussion is that when you do not create a medical market for you, if you make it difficult for abortion providers or gynecologists or obstetricians to get this experience because of the laws and regulations, and when you make it dangerous for them, um, and when you make it scary and stigmatized, nobody gets this practice or experience. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to put their name on it. And people just literally, I mean, my doctor, I think, would have done it. She knew me, but she just couldn't medically. Well, and they probably don't want to get the medical malpractice coverage for it either. Well, exactly. Yes. And I mean, so when I did go to a clinic, which technically I will say was, I'm not sure how this worked because I was looking up the more recent laws and I see that now that New Jersey has a law in the books that requires abortions after a certain point to be in a hospital. But where I had mine done was a clinic. And it's one of a few in New Jersey that will do them that late. It is a clinic that has been targeted repeatedly for some of those sting operations, like the, um, the, uh, uh, video that they did, Mm -hmm. um, that the right wing activists had done. It was actually one of the clinics that was targeted for that. They have an armed guard out front. Um, you are searched when you go in. It's on a, it's unmarked on the street. Um, there are, but there are protesters outside, um, within just a couple feet of the door and they, uh, the people who, the, the women who had to get, uh, later term abortions had to show up to be the first appointments of the day because they are the most, um, complicated and need to see, uh, the medical specialist who came in they basically had a series of rotating doctors who came in to provide this service, who had expertise in later abortions. And there were a couple of days a week they did them. And it was essentially an assembly line. And I mean, that is some of the language that you'll see in right-wing propaganda against abortion clinics. It was an assembly line. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that these women were from other states that have much stricter abortion laws than New Jersey. Um, they were from other cultures and places. They were all at least as pregnant as I was. They were, um, they separate you from your family. Your family can't go downstairs with you where the um, actual surgery is done. And I mean, this is kind of the only way to do it, to keep everybody safe and to make sure everybody can get the service because there's so many women who need this service and so few providers. And where I was in New Jersey is a large metropolitan area outside of New York City. We're not talking about a rural area. This was a lot of people. So my husband had to wait upstairs in the abortion clinic waiting room. You had to go through all the paperwork just like um, having an abortion, it, you know, just like the abortions I went to with my girlfriends in college, you know, mm-hmm. had to fill out all the paperwork. And then you went downstairs for a surgical procedure. It's actually a two day process. Um, and they give you a medication the day before with the, the abortion that I had a medication the day before, um, to start labor, basically to ripen the cervix and start labor. So we, um, it was a, it was a long process, um, incredibly traumatic, lonely, um, you know, alone by myself in a small curtain, listening to other women on either side of me cry and throw up and cry. Did you get to talk to any of the other women? Um, so no, (laughs) I mean, I'm sure I probably could have, I think everybody just kind of needed to be alone. I mean, I just, you know, I would have welcomed having my husband's hand to hold or like my best friend, but there's just really nothing to say. There's just really something about waiting to have an abortion that you don't want to have. 
of a baby that you've already named, uh, that you've already <laughs> bought a coming home for outfit, uh, of a baby that you pulled out all his big brother's clothes, and just waiting and feeling him kick and waiting for the rest of your abortion by yourself in a basement. And it is a long, I mean, I, I felt, I, I really, I have no sense of how long the time actually was. It can't have been that long. It felt like forever. And they basically gave us all the medication. We all took turns. We got into our hospital gowns. We folded our clothes and put them in a plastic bag, had to lay down on a gurney. And then they took us one by one to go actually do the surgery. Um, I was put under general anesthesia. And I, I mean, I actually didn't, I didn't think to ask about that before <laughs> I got in to, to the operating room and I was looking at the nurses and I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. And I tried to get up and, and, and I don't know what my plan was. I tried to get up and leave and I was like, I can't, I can't do this. And this, um, this is very stern Eastern European woman grabbed my shoulder and goes, listen, you're going to do this. This is what you need to do. This is a decision that's right for you. You need to lay back and you need to calm down. And, you know, like I'm sure that that probably wouldn't have been very comforting for a lot of people, but just having somebody kind of just say, get it together. You need to do this. This is like the only parenting act I could really do. In a lot of ways, for my son, this is the only thing I could really do to let him not die apart from me. It, that sounds uh, maybe like more dramatic than I usually like to be, but I felt like that was the best death I could give somebody I cared about and loved a lot is to have them at least die in a comfortable safe place and so yeah I laid back and breathed the gas and um when I woke up back in the little same like I don't know eight by six little curtained off area um it was somebody telling me like as soon as you can walk from point a to point b you can leave so I had to wait until my legs would work and I could walk between and there were some nurses there and they would watch you from one desk to the other. As soon as you could get from one to the other, you could go and put your clothes back on out of the plastic garbage bag and go back upstairs to your husband with all of your drugs and get your insurance forms sent off to where they needed to go and call them if you bleed too much. Um, and I had to take a bunch of medicine to make sure I didn't get any infections and all that stuff. And um, then my husband and I got in the car and we went to pick up our son from preschool. And, you know, we'd never told our older son because he was only two and a half mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he was at that age where, you know, kids get, like, they don't have any sense of time. Uh, Dan calls it, like, he's unstuck in time. <laughs> and, you know, tomorrow might be five minutes from now or it might be a month from now. And so we were kind of, we kind of had joked with his teachers that he was going to have a little brother, but he was going to be so ridiculously excited we couldn't tell him until it was really imminent. And they were like, that's a good idea, knowing him. So we decided we were, we were going to wait until after my 20-week appointment. Um, so we never did tell him about his brother. You know, and we, you know, I've talked to specialists on and off since then. I mean, it's been a few years now about how I'm going to eventually tell him about this. Because now he's still only six. I feel like Dumbledore, you know? Like, I feel like, <laughs> oh, he's too young now. 
and then I'm going to be like, he's going to be 17 and he's going to be like, why didn't you tell me about this? And, you know, anyway, uh, it's just sort of an impossible thing. And I think, um, you know, since then sort of weirdly, and I actually have heard a few people tell the same story. I, I, I got pregnant again very quickly, not entirely intentionally, uh, with another baby before we even really had processed what was going on. Um, and whether we wanted to have more kids or not. And I ended up, um, having a challenging and very medically precarious pregnancy with my daughter who is two years old now. Um, and I mean, it's still something I don't really know how to answer when people ask me how many kids I have, you know, mm -hmm. I felt like I kind of like heard people say that before, you know, after I'd had my miscarriage, I was like, Oh yeah, totally. I get it. But I really, I really don't know what to say. One of the reasons I was so upset when we moved from New Jersey to where we live now, which is Connecticut, is I was like, you know, nobody's going to know about our son who died. And I'm going to have to tell everybody or not tell anybody. And that whole, the whole idea of doing that was so garbagey to me, <laughs> like, I didn't know which one I wanted. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted everybody to still know. So they would know that there was this like big gaping hole <laughs> of feelings that I had, um, and give me some wide berth, but I don't know. Since then, I've just, I mean, I have to say that when I saw Donald Trump bringing it up at the debates last year, I mean, a lot of people knew about it and knew about my experience anyway. It's when I started sort of just telling random strangers about it. Like, you know, somebody talking to me at Target about diapers, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I know. Like, right after my abortion, and then, you know, just watch their face drop, jumping into acquaintances Facebook feeds <laughs> where people are arguing about abortions and what who would want a tw abortion past 20 weeks and I'll jump in hey I had an abortion past 20 weeks let me tell you um and I think that it's been a good thing the sign I decided to carry in the women's march this past winter which I'm sure all your listeners attended as well <laughs> um was ask me about my abortion mm -hmm. and uh, you know, no one did, but <laughs> it felt good to carry it. I think it was something that if you can share it, it's sort of like the sexual assault discussion. If you can share that story without risking your own mental health, I think it's a good thing. It sucks that the onus is on women to do that, but I think it's a net good for society to talk about it as openly as possible. Yeah. I mean... I think it is, too. You know, I, I, I said this at the beginning, but I, I have struggled with the idea of abortion for a lot of my life. You know, I was raised Catholic, and... I, sort of went through this this whole thing in the our larger conversation but you know I think hearing actual stories made me realize that it, it was not this black and white issue that it had been in my mind and if you don't hear those stories if you don't know that there's real people behind them it's a lot more difficult to get your mind around what it really means yeah oh I totally agree and I think that what what's so interesting to me is that like the political movement uh, of anti-choice activity has focused on abortions like mine, which I find bizarre <laughs> as their thing to chip away because there's nobody 
who has an abortion after like 18, 19 weeks, whose story is not incredibly depressing. Like, 